Can you see my screen? Okay. I guess it's plenty of ones. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. So um, a very warm welcome to everyone um, for joining us. Uh, I am Bamborde, and I am co-founder at uh, Zaiku Group, and I will be your host. Um, you can visit zaikugroup.com to learn more about uh, the company, but briefly, we are an R&D and consultancy consortium with uh, focus in emerging deep tech and mathematics. Uh, today, I'm thrilled to have uh, Mihao, um, currently a quantum software engineer at uh, Sapata Computing, more precisely working from their uh, Toronto office. The quantum computing interest centers around uh, variational um, uh, algorithms, um, optimization, and near-term uh, applications. Um, an interesting thing about Mihao is uh, his versatility. He comes from a uh, physics, machine learning, and engineering background. And this is very clear from his um, um, from the work he has uh, done uh, that he's uh, kind of uh, uh, leveraging his uh, multidisciplinary skills to try to bridge the gap between research and engineering, software engineering. This is very interesting because it helps drive innovation uh, faster. We all know that there is uh, still um, uh, a gap between fundamental research and industry, even for the applied subjects. In fact, often you see researchers write great papers and with great ideas, but there is little to no implementation, say, for example, in terms of a code that uh, you know industry people, engineers can go and play around with. So yeah, so it's really um, a, a, a pleasure to have uh, Mihao uh, speak uh, today. Uh, now, in terms of the webinar itself, um, there will be the main session by Mihao. Um, after the main session, there will be Q and A's, and then we will have like a, a closure, a kind of a closing remarks about uh, uh, what next in our webinar series. But just to give you a flavor, uh, the webinar is really centered around deep tech uh, and encourage inter interdisciplinary collaboration between fundamental researchers and industry. The topics on this slide are just some of the topics that we will be covering by inviting speakers across the globe. So if any of you in the, uh, on the audience uh, would like to be a speaker, after the webinar, we will send out an email about how you can submit uh, uh, talks. Uh, for the time being, uh, you can uh, follow us on Twitter or Crowdcast, so you can get alerted uh, when we uh, um, kind of schedule the next uh, talk. So um, this is it for me now, for now, and I will hand over to our uh, guest, uh, Mihao, to uh, Proceed. I'll just stop and stop sharing. Okay, so Mihao, uh, floor is yours. Uh, hello. So let me just share my screen one moment. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yeah. I I type yes if you do. I like the system. <laughs> Very lazy classical way, huh? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, if it works, it works, right? <laughs> okay, so at least, okay. I hope I hope you see. So um, I will be I will be having my presentation. So I don't see either chat or anything that's other that's happening on the screen. So yeah. if if there is like there are some issues or like people say they can't hear me or or whatever, please please uh, let me know. No bumper there. Yeah, yeah, everything okay. seems okay. Cool, cool. Uh, also, like I, I won't have access to the questions like during the talk. So, like so, sorry, people. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Michal, and today I would like to tell you a little bit about variational quantum factoring and in particular my implementation of this algorithm. Um, before we start, like, thank you very much, Bamborde, for inviting me. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to be here, even though virtually. So, okay, a little bit about me. Um, so I work as a quantum software engineer at Zapata Computing. I developing Orchestra, our computational platform. I am implementing various algorithms, both classical and, and quantum, and I'm also helping with some research projects, mostly on the implementation side. 
Um, apart from that, I'm also involved in Quantum Open Source, for Open Source Foundation, where I run a mentorship program uh, in Q4 Climate Initiative, where we try to figure out how to use quantum computing for you know, solving some huge climate problems. We don't have you know, anything uh, too much to share uh, for now, but we are working on it. And also, I have a blog called Musty Thoughts where I share my, share my uh, you know, thoughts about quantum computing and, and other topics. And also, before I get to the proper presentation, I just, just to give you some context. So this presentation was actually done as a part of recruitment process to Zapata in May 2019. So actually, it's like about one year old. So I assume you have some basic idea how QAOA works. Um, I won't be going very much into, into details and um, perhaps I will just like explain like some, some basic concepts and also that this is, um, well, this algorithm I will be talking about its implementation of the scientific paper written by Eric Anschwitz at, and like other people, people from Zapata. So yeah, just like to, to make things clear. Um, okay, so the goal of this presentation is like threefold. So one, I would like to explain how VQF works, um, so that like after this presentation, you have the rough idea about you know what this algorithm does. The second is show some like practical use of QAOA. So like how does QAOA works in practice? How can you play with that, how, you know, it behaves and so on. And also about like, I also want to show how to approach making a quantum computing research project, uh, what's like methodology for, for that and, and so on. Um, well, I will not be talking too much about methodology itself, but you will see how I approach it. And I, I hope you can learn from that. So I will start from introduction. I think I already covered that. Uh, then overview, uh, algorithm overview, then like tell a little bit about my imp implementation, the research I've done, and then we'll sum it up. So why implementing VQF, VQF at all? So there are a couple of reasons why I did this project. So one of the reasons is that it was interesting. So I read the paper basically like a couple of months before when it first went live and i was really i really like the paper i really like the math and um, yeah i mean it was fun to read so i thought it would be fun to implement the other reason is that it's a good example of a hybrid approach where you do some um, computations on quantum computer some computations of on classical computer and you you know you, you by improving either of these, you actually get get a benefit. I would say that this is pretty unconventional use of QAOA. So factoring numbers is not something that you usually frame as an optimization problem. So I was pretty intrigued by this. Also, factorization is an important problem. You know, like most people know Shor's algorithm for factorization. And well, without that, this is one of the most important algorithms in, in the field of quantum computing. So having a different algorithm for, you know, doing factoring um, sounds like, you know, important thing. Also making a open source uh, project, like implementing algorithms from papers is a great way to learn. Um, I thought this would make a good open source project. To, to do and last but not least you know it seemed like a suitable uh, project to do for recruitment process for Zapata it's like implementing their own paper you know sounds reasonable so now getting to the algorithm itself okay so the goal of the algorithm is doing factorization of a by prime number so given a number m we want to find p and q such that m equals p times q so this is basically factorization 
Um, one caveat here is that we actually care only for by prime numbers. So number which are product of two prime numbers. Mm, we don't care about, you know, M equal M equals P times Q times R times S times E T. Um, because it turns out that you can always kind of transform your problem to, to by, by prime factorization. And this is also more uh, important from the point of view of cryptography. If, okay, so I will probably, so I will go through the whole algorithm. And if at the end something's unclear, then I will like tell you to, to ask me questions in the chat and I will be answering them. Because um, like some things might be unclear at first, but then I will be keep, keep explaining it. So, you know, don't don't be afraid. So the overview of the algorithm is as follows. So we start from a number M. Then we perform pre-processing, which basically mm, creates a set of clauses. So clauses are like, let's say like, like, equal, like let's say like equations. So we have this set of clauses, then we can trans like put these clauses into the optimization algorithm, uh, which is using QAOA. Then out of this, we run it on a you know quantum computer or simulator or whatever. We get some samples out of this. Then we do post-processing and analysis of the samples, and finally we get you know final result, right? So what is P and Q? Um, now let me tell you what the mathematical representation we use here. So we are dealing with um, binary numbers. So M is equal to you know this sum, which is basically just the composition of the number into its, its binary representation. So M K is just like a kth bit of M, right? Same for P K and Q K. Also, if you write this write like the whole equation m equals p times q you will get a set of equations and i will tell you in a moment like how do you make this set of equations um but basically these equations looks like like the first one here and then what we do in the mm, vqf is we say okay this first one you know it's equal to zero right so this is like a regular e equation but what we actually want to do we want to say it's equal to some constant c i right so this is this clause so we create a set of clauses like this and ideally we would like them to be equal to zero so we want to see to be equal to zero so then we can have our set of equations transformed into an optimization problem Right, optimization problem where we try to minimize the sum of squares of CI. Why do we do that? Well, we do it because um, we don't know, you know, all the values of PK and QK a priori, and we want to use optimization algorithm to um, solve this problem. And you no, know, this is just the way you can you can frame this whole problem of finding right pk and qk uh, qk as uh, as optimization so to make it a little bit more concrete um i know it, it at this point it, it might be confusing but here is an example of these equations and example of how do you perform binary multiplication so first thing first like binary multiplication is basically the same as regular multiplication we usually work in the base of 10, but the same method applies to the base of um, of 2. So we have two numbers. I hope you also see my mouse. If you don't see my mouse, please, uh, Bumber, please, please let me know. So we have number P and Q. In this case, we assume we know the length of P and Q. That's why we can say that, you know, this number here is one and this one is one as well. So we also know the last bits because 
numbers needs to be even, right? If the numbers were odd, the, the problem is trivial because we know that one, one prime is two and the other is whatever. And, you know, we are, it's pretty easy to, to spot if the number is even or not. So we know that the number are odds. That's why we have like one at the end. So then we just like perform multiplication. So the first line is, you know, one, one times one, P2, P1 and one. And we get the first line. Then the second line is Q1 times P. So it's Q1 times one, P2 times Q1, P1 times Q1 and Q1 times one and so on and so on. Um, then we have carry bits. I will get to this in a moment. And then, well, we know the result of this multiplication, right? We know M, M, which is 143. So we can write down all the bits here. So we know that, you know, one equals one. Then we, this is trivial. Then we can like add and know that P1 plus Q1 equals one. But, and as, as you can see here in this, in this equation, but this actually is not entirely true because if, well, in this case, um, okay. So because if P1 is equal to one and Q1 is equal to one, then we will actually get zero here plus some carry bit Z12. So this is, like in the regular multipli multiplication or like addition, if your sum is too big, right, you just kind of move it to another column, to the next column to the left. And this is where these carry bits like come from. So if we had like one and one here, we would get zero here and one carry bit here, right? So in this column, for example, if all of the bits here were equal to one, so one, 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 and actually one, then we would have to move one carry bit to this column and one to this column. And if we proceed and proceed and proceed, we finally get to a set of equations like this. Okay, so I hope this is this is clear, mm, or at least you, you get the, the general idea. So now, how do we get from these clauses to something that we can feed into our optimization algorithm. So basically we could just like create clauses out of these equations, but there are some rules that allow us to make the equations much simpler. So for example, we know that if we have an expression of this form, so X times Y minus one equals zero, well, this can be true only if both X and Y are equal to one. We deal with binary numbers so they can be equal to like either one or zero so then we know the values of x and y and we can substitute these values in all the equations look at the equations again and see whether we can apply some other rules so these are like basic pre basic rules that i took from the vqf paper and basically after applying all the pre-processing rules we have much smaller set of equations much smaller set of clauses and well we can we have like a simpler optimization problem to to solve so this is one place where this um, hybrid approach uh, comes in because this is like one of the things that we do on the classical computer right we, we don't there's like nothing quantum about it from from this point on on you can just take these clauses and like put it into classical solver and use classical optimization algorithm to, to solve this as well. Okay, and then after we have clauses, we want to translate it into something that we can feed into a quantum computer, we can feed into QAOA specifically. So what we do, as, as you might remember, we had here this, um, this uh, last, equation here so that we take a square like a sum of squares of clauses so this is exactly what sorry what we are doing here we take each clause we have square it and then add them all together and this is our hamiltonian so 
like actually this is not yet our hamiltonian this is um so this is how this equation looks like this is our cost function let's say this is how this equation looks like when we like write everything out and to make it a hamiltonian we need to substitute each of these bits like ai so either pi or qi with an operator like this where this sigma z is um, Pauli z operator. So this basically the way, is a way to construct an Ising uh, operator, an Ising Hamiltonian out of set of clauses. So right now at this at this point we have an Ising Hamiltonian and having Ising representing our uh, factoring problem, and from this we can just like use it for to create a QAOA instance and solve the problem using QAOA. Okay, so now how the optimization part works. So we start from the cost Hamiltonian, which I just described. QAOA also requires having a mixing Hamiltonian, sometimes denoted as HB. Then we basically create a QYOA circuit out of this. Then we use some optimization algorithm to search for some good initial parameters. With this, um, oh yeah, so, sorry, like good initial parameters, we, we actually do grid search for, for doing this. Then we feed these good initial parameters to BFGS optimization algorithm, which is like classical optimization algorithm. It allows us to find better parameters so we go back to the QAO circuit, replace the parameters, add another layer, search for um, another set of good initial parameters for another layer, optimize this layer with BFGS, and you know, again and again, until finally we we get final parameters. We can we run our circuit with the final parameters, get a final quantum state measure it and get some results out of this so okay so here for those of you who are not very familiar with qa way so qa way um is an algorithm which takes two which we, we which has like the following construction it has layers and each layer is built based of cost Hamiltonian and mixing Hamiltonian. And each, each layer has two parameters. One is called gamma, and it's associated with cost Hamiltonian, and one is beta, which is associated with mixing Hamiltonians. So when I'm talking about parameters, I'm talking about uh, beta and gamma. We also sometimes call them angles. Um, yeah, so that's basically how it, how it works. Okay, so again how it works in case of vqf so this is just qaoa part and this is vqf so we perform pre-processing then we create hamiltonian then we perform angle initialization and then we perform optimization and what's 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 important is um that if we like show the algorithm in this like modular way we see that if we improve any of these steps, uh, we basically can get better results, right? So perhaps it's like it's always good when you when you think about an algorithm that you have. Uh, it's always good to think about it in, in a way of pipeline because one of these boxes here might be might be a bottleneck. So if you improve you you find which one is bottleneck and if you improve this you will get like the most gain out of out of it right so for example if the pre-processing pre-processing is actually very naive then probably it's more worth spending some time to improve pre-processing rather than the optimization algorithm or vice versa it depends okay so at this point is this more or less clear or are there any questions so i will for a moment i will go back to the chat um okay so 
Any questions? Uh, there is no, okay, there's one question on the Q&A right now. Why you squared and add the clauses to get the Hamiltonian? Okay, so this is a standard procedure in optimization. Uh, okay, so I will get to the, oh, sorry, I will get to the slides. Mm -hmm. Here, so basically, uh, this is standard procedure in, in optimization because you want to have a function which um, like behaves well, basically. And if you have a square, then well, square has this nice property that, you know, no matter like parabola has this nice property that if you move from to right or left from minimum, you kind of are moving. There, there is a minimum of this function, right? And that's one thing. And the other that like the values are always positive. So you know that like the minimum is actually zero. Um, I will. So that's like basically why we why we want to square things. Uh, it's it's like standard thing. Like you kind of do it very often. And why we make a sum out of this? Well, because you have a set of like you have all these different clauses, and all these different clauses represent the whole problem. So you know that if this is equal to zero, then you have the right solution, right? So the best case scenario is if you sum all the clauses and find such parameters of qi pi and z that this sum of cl squared clauses is equal to zero so that's basically that's basically it okay so i will tell you briefly about the tools i've used for this project so first i used the uh, pipe stack for this so i used qyy implementation from growth which is a library of algorithms built built on top of pipewell which in turn is um a library python library for um, doing quantum computing uh developed by rigetti computing a startup from um, california and also i used their simulator called qvm so that's basically what I what I did. I have not used any like real quantum computer. That's like the whole project is done on, on simulator. So then uh, for visualization, I used matplotlib. For pre-processing, I used SymPy. So this is a Python library for symbolic um, calculations. Then, well, of course, as a like version control system, I used Git and GitHub. One of the most important tools was, you know, just like pen and paper. So I had this notebook and I've covered, you know, countless pages trying to figure out how you actually perform this binary multiplication and how all the clauses look like and like just, you know, writing them, solving it all by hand and then comparing it with my, and comparing it with my code and so on and so on. And well, I like to listen to music when I work. So for this project, I was listening mostly to Hamilton the Musical and awesome um, mix from Guardians of the Galaxy movie. I strongly recommend both this, um, you know, tracks. Okay, so now implementation. So let me show you my GitHub repository. So this is basically the GitHub repository where all the code sits. Mm, I will just like briefly briefly tell you about the structure. So, yeah, well, I have code which sits in the VQF package, a couple of scripts. I have research. Oh, I have tests. I have even some tests. That's nice. I didn't know that. <laughs> so then I have research. And research is um, where I actually conducted all the experiments. So I did, whenever I did an experiment, I was putting all the code inside such like directory. And I also put all the results 
here, all the all the plots, as well as a report, um, which describes you know what I have found out in this particular experiment and uh, what are like some conclusions and and so on and so on. Um, so this is part of the. Okay. Ah, and one thing I, I tried to you know keep all the requirements. Um, to keep track of all the all the libraries I used and the requirements. So basically, if you just like download it, you, and you should be able to to just run it, and you have you you should know like which libraries versions of the libraries I used. So it it should just run. Um, so I try to make it as like easy to to run for people. So I added readme, I added requirements, and and so on and so on. And uh, one thing I would like to um, tell you a little bit more about is the research pros process itself. So this is the methodology. Um, as you've seen, like I have this like experiments. Each experiment is in a separate directory. Each directory has specific structures or results, code, and so on and so on. So this is basically the research methodology that we have started when I was working at Estimode, an IoT startup in Krakow. So we kind of came up with a similar methodology for doing research. Then when I came, uh, when I joined Bohr Technology, um, like and again another quantum startup, and I we we have also used this research methodology, and it is explained, described in this file in one of the Bohr uh, repositories. And basically the, the benefits of doing that is that A, you have you know a clear structure, you have uh, you have reproducibility because in this case each repository has like copy of the code that was used to run it, like each store, each directory. So basically if I find a bug month from now, I can go back to my code, fix this bug in like the version I used to produce some results, I rerun it all to see whether this bug actually influenced the old results or not. And then like perform analysis um, of the results with with this correction. And well, I'm it, it really saves a lot of trouble and, and hassle and just like makes things much more organized. So I really like this methodology um, if you like feel free to, to check it out. If you have any questions, I, I would love to, to answer them. Okay, and so that's about the code. Maybe not too much, but uh, you can just like take a look at GitHub. Now I would like to tell you uh, more about the actual research I have done here. So I performed four experiments. So one was about pre-processing and getting it right. Another one was about um, checking whether optim optimization algorithm I have works, um, whether I can reproduce the results from the paper. Another one was about actually trying a better initialization strategy for the optimization. And the last one was just like visualizing the, the optimization space. So I will I will show you. So the first one was about the pre-processing and well, the goal was to implement the pre-processing um, procedure from the paper. And basically I implemented the logic, but then it turned out that I wasn't able to reproduce the results. So I was spending a lot of time trying to figure out what what's what's the issue. Finally, I find the issue, fix the problem, perform simulations, and you know describe the results compared it with with the paper. Okay, so I a couple of slides ago I have shown you some mm, rules, like some basic rules. So apart from that, I also found that there is like another um, another rule which I later learned is called parity rule, which basically says that if we have a clause like this, so x play plus y minus two times z, well, this basically means that 
since this number here is even, that this sum here also needs to be even, right? And the only way to do that is if we set x equal y, but then we have two times x equals two times z, so we have that all the numbers are equal. So they're like in the in the very similar, in the very similar uh, way. There are like other um, other rules like this, um, which basically boil down to like the same the same principle. That for example, if we have you know if x is if we have this like even number here, then it means that x plus one must be even. But also because, um, well, because we have al already like one here, it implies that x needs to also be equal one, and then z is also equal one, and and so on and so on. Okay, so after in, like adding this rule to the like set of set of rules, um, I got some results. And before that, I, I just wanted to go back a little bit. And there was like one issue here that I, I wasn't able to reproduce the results uh, from the paper. And even with this uh, improved improved rule. So what I did, you know, I first implemented all the logic from the paper. I, did, I wasn't able to reproduce the results. So I implemented this. I thought maybe I'm, you know, missing something. Because the paper stated that the what the paper stated that uh, we use the following rule, like the five rules that I listed uh, already, along with some other trivial relations. So I thought, well, perhaps they counted this one as a trivial relation, and you know, I implemented that, and I implemented a couple of others. Uh, well, maybe maybe not too much, but like. Um, refine it a little bit, but I still wasn't able to to find the reason why it doesn't work. And finally, I figured out that there is one place in the paper that I actually mentioned that they assume that they know the length of P and Q. So once I introduced this like small caveat, uh, it turned out that actually I get better results that they got in the paper. So now let's get to the results. So here is the original plot uh, that was in the paper. So I added this line at 40 as, as a reference because I didn't have access to the data. I just, you know, that's like copy paste from the from the paper, like the graphics. So what this plot shows us. So it shows us that at the x axis is the number that we want to factor. At the y is the number of qubits required to do this. So basically, the number of qubits means the number of variables pi, qi, and z, uh, ij. So z is like the carabit that we have used um, that we need to like that are left after the pre processing. So if we have very good preprocessing, it turns out that it actually solves our problem and we need like zero qubits, right? If we have slightly worse preprocessing, it actually cannot solve the problem. And there are like a couple of variables that we need to solve for. And this comparison is basically the one, the blue case is like no classical preprocessing. So we just take all the clauses that we have and feed it into the algorithm. And as you can see, the, the scaling is like not very good. Uh, just to remind you, the Google Sycamore chip had 53 qubits. And the, so that's, we can treat it roughly as a limit of, you know, uh, how many qubits we, we could have now. And well, here without any pre-processing, we actually, for numbers which are like around 10,000, we can easily get up to you know, 140 qubits or more, 150 perhaps. So that's basically the, the original results. And we can see that with pre-processing, actually the scaling is, is much better. So my pre-processing gave the following results. So basically um, you can see that it's better. So we are like the, the, the whole curve is lower. And also we have much more cases which are just solved by pre-processing. 
So adding this this additional rules really really helped. Um, but also I I performed some experiments because I, I really wanted to reproduce the results from the paper. You know, it was nice that I got some improvement, but I wanted to have a reference point. So I wanted to be able to get exactly this plot. So what I tried, I tried also removing the parity rule that I talked about a moment ago. And then the results were slightly worse than this, but still, well, different from the original plot. So there seems that even though I tried, there are some implementation uh, differences here. And also this is the, the, the problem, the implementation I was like working on, I would say like until I realized this is not what they did in paper. So this is if we don't know the length of P and Q in advance. So this means that the leading, uh, the, the basically one of this number can be, can has as many beats as, uh, you know, as many beats as M. So the number we are trying to, to factor and the other also has like half that many bits, uh, which is usually is not the case. Usually there is like kind of balance and like they're, they're shorter, but well, we, there might be like some bad cases and uh, we, if we don't assume this knowledge, we get much worse results. So on average with this pre-processing, I got, um, I, I don't remember like exact, exact, exact value, but, but introducing parity rule improved it by three qubits on average. So if we add this rule, we need three qubit less on average to solve this problem. And if we know, um, pre-process, if, if we don't know the length of P and Q, it turns out that we need 16 more qubits on average than in this case. So well, that was a nice result. Okay, so there are like some software challenges here. So it turns out that SymPy, while it's pretty powerful tool, you know, symbolic um, calculations, it's, it's nice. There are some challenges. So one thing is that just like parsing those expressions produce like a lot of, uh, I would say pretty um, nasty code. So actually I, I can show you how it looks like. Um, so basically we have a lot of different if statements. So this is like most of the code, apply pre-processing rules, simplify clauses, and most of this clause is just like if else in, you know, different statement. So if we have like, and like parsing it, you know, if we have addition in the clause, then we do something. Uh, if this is symbol or this is number, we need different um, conditions to do that. If the number of terms is odd, uh, no, like if the number of odd terms is something, we do something else. If else, you know, it's, it's not the prettiest code I've written in my life. Let's be honest. So that was like one of the one of the challenges, and I really believe it could be refactored once I like finished it and you know I, I knew how to simplify. It. I, I believe it could be refactored and like simplified, but but still, it was it, it was some challenge. And also another pretty interesting thing from the software um, perspective was that SymPy introduced its own kind of randomness into the process. So for running exactly the same code, I was sometimes getting different results. And what was surprising was that even though I tried to set the seed parameter for random module in Python and for NumPy module in Python, still, so basically I should have the same results still i got like sometimes slightly different results for the same cases um what's i what i think it came from was that i had some um, imperfect rules so like i wasn't you know covering all the cases actually so sometimes it processed it one way or the other what's interesting after i refined the rules uh this you know this spread uh this randomness actually was smaller and smaller Okay, so what are potential improvements here? 
um, for this code. I, I did. If any of you would like to contribute to that repository, I would be happy to to see that. So, like I'm I'm aware of you know this, this shortcoming. So one thing I, I use a lot of loops, for loops instead of recurrence. So recurrence would be much more uh, elegant. But well, I, I didn't have that much time to to actually do that. I just wanted to make it work. There are some more rules that could be added. Uh, also, the the parity rule is just like one huge if else you know statement monster, and it could be I believe it could be written in like much more compact mathematical form. Uh, oh, so adding more rules, one thing, but like improving existing rules, like accounting for some edge cases, is is another. Okay, so this is about um, the pre-processing. So once again, like if you have any questions, I'd like to. Answer. Whoa, five questions. Okay. Okay. So, uh, is it possible to use SAT solver to help? I have no idea. Can you explain how did you arrive at the Ising Hamiltonian? Um, I can do that at the end. What if QA away gets close to the ground state? I will actually get there, uh, perhaps, or go at the end. Okay, the Zapata question also at the end, and approach is clear, but not the construction of clauses. Mm, so yeah, this might be actually important, so I will go back. Okay. Okay, so basically construction, construction of clauses um, comes from this slide, right? So we, make make a sum of p1 like you know p1 q1 equals one so this is p, uh, plus this like carry bits which would go there so we have this equation and we then we move everything to the left hand side right and we have equation that p1 plus q1 minus one minus two times z12 equals zero and this is basically a clause so instead saying this is equal to zero because this is equal to zero only for the like the correct values of all the p q and z uh we say well we will this is the problem that we will try to solve so it is equal to some constant c and therefore uh if we get some bits wrong it might be greater than zero so this is why, like, how we construct the clauses, um, and then we square them to get the, the nice smooth quadratic function. When it comes to constructing Hamiltonian, well, this is basically what they did in paper. Um, that's the construction they used. Perhaps there is like a smarter one. Perhaps not. This is uh, actually, if you if you look at it, it's uh, similar to what we do in. Um, Okay, so what what it what it says that so the values here like p and q and z they can be either equal to either zero or one, but if we have the sigma z operator, it has eigenvalues which are equal to either one or minus one. So in case we have one. Which corresponds to measuring qubit um, zero, like uh, measuring zero for a qubit, we get zero here. So, like a binary value here. And in case we have uh, we the eigenvalue of this is equal to minus one, then this is one minus minus one. So this is two. So divided by two, it's one. So this is equal to the mm, binary value one of you know, given variable, and basically, well, I, I think I for for those, I, I don't want to go into any more details here. Uh, I think I've described it well in my VQE article, so you can check this out, and I hope this will this will help. And also, like the the recent QA way, like I, I think this after reading these two articles, it should be fairly clear why why I'm doing it this way. Okay. Um, mm. so now I will tell you about the, the optimization. So, well, the goal was to reproduce the, the optimization procedure from the paper. 
So I implemented the core code, selected set of numbers. So the thing is, I, I couldn't select the exact same numbers they presented in the paper because I had different set of pre-processing rules and well needed to choose a couple of other ones that would have similar um, kind of properties. There were like custom pre-processing rules for these two, two numbers that they mentioned they used in paper. So I just implemented these custom rules because these numbers have some interesting mathematical properties that you can exploit to actually make the pre-processing much more efficient. Performed simulation described results. Then I actually added also noise and sampling um, to see how it um, how this works not on like ideal simulation but like not ideal and then added another um, optimization algorithm which is called LBFGSB. So basically I mentioned that I'm use, I, I was using BFGS algorithm but this is uh, and this is like the the extension of, of that okay so there will be a couple of differences from the paper um, when it comes to my implementation and the first one is i use different numbers so obviously the results will be different the other is that in the paper they actually were running noisy simulations and actually i wasn't able to run noisy simulations for all the cases because I didn't have, you know, strong enough computer uh, and running noisy simulations is taking a lot of time. So because of that, my results are deterministic because there wasn't any, you know, like anything indeterministic about it. Um, and therefore, uh, I don't have error bars in my plots. And also, there are for sure some implementation differences that leads to some differences in the results. So keep that in mind. And also the numbers I used. So in the paper, they had like this six numbers and they showed the results for, for these six numbers. I have chosen, I had to change a couple of numbers because, um, well, as I said, because I had different pre-processing rules. So in some cases, actually in, in all cases, uh, the results were like, for example, for 35, uh, it was, as far as I remember, it was solved by my pre-processing rules, like without any need for QA away. So I, I had to choose some other, um, other numbers and what I was looking for I was looking for the numbers which after my process pre-processing have the same number of qubits and the same number of caribits because you know it's like to make it more comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges I was also trying to find the numbers that have like similar uh, symmetry so and but it failed in in two cases so symmetry is if you have m which is oh so it's not about m symmetry is about p and q so if you have p and q which have the same length then no it's not about oh damn sorry i, I actually forgot right now what symmetry was it, it was so um, i think symmetry was about Damn, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Sorry for that. I think symmetry was about um, that the P and Q had the same bit length, but actually I see in this case, it's not true as well as in this case. So I'm confused, but it was some property. You can check that in the paper. It was some property of the numbers um, that could have made it like more like easier to solve or or harder like hard to say okay anyway the results i got so this is the original original plot and squared overlap is basically um well if the closer to one the better right so that's the um that's basically like how much the final state we produced with qaoa overlaps 
with um, like the state representing the correct solution. So this is uh, the original plot. So there are like two plots. One is like how good the results are, and the other is how many times we had to evaluate uh, the function. So like basically how many calls we did to the quantum computer, in this case, quantum simulator. So another thing is that we have used QA away uh, up to eight layers, right? So in this case, we had two parameters, beta and gamma. In this case, we had like four parameters to optimize, six and so on and so on. So some of the things that we see here is that actually I was able to find the exact solutions for uh, like the blue line and the red line, which are like th these numbers, mm, which is good. I roughly, uh, so, so basically for the red number, I actually improved a lot over what they had here. Um, however, like it behaves differently at the beginning. So at the beginning, it seems to be, at least for like for the blue, it seems to be much worse. Um, for this number, like this huge number for which we, I, I knew I had like exact same rules as, um, as they did in the original paper. Um, well, it's interesting. It seems that like I got actually pretty similar results. Same for the purple one. For the green and orange, actually, the results are like pretty bad in the original paper. For in my case, they are much better. So one thing to keep in mind is that well, my simulation is actually ideal and not noisy. So you know, it's it's not exactly comparing the same things and the other i'm using actually different numbers so what we can see for example for this brown line is that even though i got around 0.5 and they got also around 0.5 i was running a simulation that was you know much uh easier like it was it was pure and they were running it with noise so it kind of means that you know i i should have gotten like some better results than I did um, because the, this case is easier. Anyway, well, the results are not like that much different, right? So I was like not super happy with 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 this, but quite happy um, because you know it's it's not that I I got totally different results. However, the the issue was with the number of function evaluations because they had. I don't know. I had like basically five times more function evaluations um, than than they did. So here we are in like eight hundreds, and I'm in like five thousands, which is uh, well quite. It's even more than you know five times. <laughs> so this is quite a lot, and the one of the reasons for that I, I didn't know it at the time. But one of the reasons was that um, they used different way of like that might be might be an issue that actually they used different way of getting the number of function evaluations than I did. There's like some way in SciPy that you can you can do that. So this might be the reason for the discrepancy here. But uh, as well, it oh and the other reason was that I learned later. So I will get to to this plot. So. And this was for BFGS, and this one is for LBFGSB, which is like a different version of the same optimization algorithm. And as you can see, the results are pretty similar. Actually, even using LBFGS uh, B is like worse, in especially in the case of red, because you see, we we are like here. Um, we like converge much much later, um, but. Well, still, like most of the results are, are pretty similar, uh, but the number of function evaluations is much better. Like we are just in much lower numbers. And actually, after I learned later, they, they actually used uh, after talking with with Eric, uh, they actually used LBFGSB in this uh, in this paper, not regular BFGS. So that's also why I get I'm getting better numbers. Like actually, apart from these two outliers here. Um, well, we are 
roughly in the same in the same spot. Okay, so what could be done to make this research better? So this could be run with uh, noise. Uh, investigate BFGS discrepancy. Well, I already covered that. Different optimization methods could be could be improved and could be implemented, and we could you, you know we could try to use um, just like different optimization strategy. I don't know uh, SLSQP or some how it's called um, adaptive optimization or something else. And also, what I would like to do someday would be like circuit analysis. So basically, analyzing how deep the circuits are in this case, and how many gates, like different types of gates we are using to create the circuits. Okay, so the next thing I did was um, changing the initialization strategy. So this is also something, uh, when I was implementing it, I sent an email to, to Eric with some questions because I wasn't sure what exactly they meant by like certain you know methods in in the paper and he suggested to me that like one of the improvements could be done would be using this strategy from from this paper and it's pretty interesting so I will show you a little bit how this works what they found out in the paper and what results I got so basically what they found in the paper is that if we run layer by layer like if we run QA away and like optimize the parameters uh the higher the number of the layer the higher is the value of gamma and also the lower the um, the higher the number of layer the lower is the value of beta and therefore um so the the initialization strategy that has been used before like in, in this research i discussed so far was that after adding a new layer we were using previous layers with the parameters we found before that are working best adding a new one and running a grid search to find some good starting parameters for this layer and then optimizing with bfgs uh, all these parameters of all the layers but what what they found in this paper was that actually um, there might be a more efficient way to do that instead of doing like grid search on like full uh, space of parameters we could observe that actually uh, these parameters like seem to line lie on line so when we add a new layer we can more or less like predict where uh, what the parameters for this layer should be uh, both for gamma and for beta so this like exactly how it works is uh, is described in the paper but so what i did i i just took they're proposing two strategies one is called interp the other is called fourier and i used the interp one implemented it and checked how it works so basically you can see that the solid lines are the old results and the dashed lines are the results with the new um, optimization strategy. And in some cases, it works like slightly better, like this orange one here. Um, we see it helped. For here, like the red, except this, this outlier, I have no idea what, what's happening here, but except this outlier, it actually works uh, better. Um, slightly better here, slightly worse here. So same like with the number of function evaluations it actually hard to say i mean it works pretty similar right but there is like one improvement that um, one improvement that it definitely made or gave us which is that we don't need to perform the grid search every time we run a new layer and the grid grid search you know to, to find like reasonable parameters for the research you, you need to run like hundreds of circuit evaluations so adding every layer would add like hundreds of circuit evaluations and who, here we just like get rid out of this after i don't know like first layer uh, because for the first layer we don't have any data to you know, do such interpolation and well we just get it kind of for free so 
that's already a, um, an improvement. Okay, so I'm just like, check out the questions. Okay. So does anyone have like questions regarding the optimization part? Okay. So if not, if yes, I will answer them later. If not, I will get straight to the last part, which actually I find uh, the most interesting. So this is visualization of optimization space. So at Estimote, we had this golden rule that if you are stuck with a problem, it means you are not visual, not visualizing it properly. So I wanted to just like see how the landscape of these functions, um, optimization functions look like in case of QA way. So what I did, I did a couple of experiments. So for the six numbers I showed you, uh, I, I used for this research, I plotted, like I, I made a grid search, right? To find, evaluate the value of the Hamiltonian at like each pair of parameters on the grid. And I think the resolution here was like 200 by 200. So this is like pretty, pretty decent. So if you remember like zero means that we are, like we have found correct solution, right? And the higher we are, the worse. So there are like a couple of interesting things to, to be seen here. And I kind of didn't like know that, um, know that before. I mean, it surprised me to, to actually like see this, but for some numbers, you can see that we've basically found the optimum with one layer. Oh, the, the important thing, you can only do this type of plots having one layer. Well, because then we have two parameters and the value which you can color code. And if you try to do it in the four layers, you have four parameters and visualization in like more dimensions than three is pretty hard. So that's why like, we use only two, um, like only one layer. So as you can see for this problem, we can actually find um, zeros, right? So this is exactly solvable by using just one layer, but actually the others are not. So no matter how hard you try, it's like not possible to solve these problems with QA away with one layer, which actually uh, is also, kind of described in the, I think in the recent papal, paper from Google, uh, like the, the, I think it was, it was described in the one by Ed Farhi. Um, why, you know, what, why, why is, what, what might be the reason for that? But for me, it was like kind of surprise. Uh, I thought that, you know, there's perhaps my optimization procedure is not good enough, but actually, no, like just the depth of the algorithm is, is not good enough. So this is like the ideal case. And this is the same in the log scale. So as you can see, like another thing that you can like take from this plot is that, well, this, some of these optimization landscape are pretty rugged and crazy. So if you start from the wrong place, for example, here, uh, it's like easy to, to get into some like local optima, right? There are like so many of them or in this, uh, on, in this plot for 2,893, um, well, it's like the same. There are like many local optimas. However, for two bottom plots, which are like the most, like the, the clauses are like easiest, let's say most regular, um, Actually, the, the, the plots are like pretty nice. So I wanted to see how the noise is in, like impacting the, the results. So for, I tried two things. So one was that like actually noisy simulate, like one thing was noise, but noisy simulations require quite a lot of time. So I was running it with different noise parameters. And for 100, 100 um, samples per point. So that's why resolution is, is worse. I don't remember exactly which noise model I was doing. 
uh, I was using here, I think it was um, like polychannel for like different poly. So basically, like probability of uh, applying round like random Pauli gate, um, like it's, it's a noise parameter, but I, I, I I'm not not exactly sure. Um, however, what we can see is that for small noise, we can easily find where are the local optimas, like minimas here, right? It, it reflects it pretty well. For slightly higher noise, we still get basically the same structure of the optimization landscape, just like the values are, the, the scale is, is the same for, on all the plots. The colors are closer to white, so the like it's it's flattened, right? And then above some threshold, basically the noise kills everything and you, you can't see anything. I also wanted to see how the sampling uh, influences the results. So here I use like no sum, like ideal simulation with no sampling error. Here I use it with 1000 samples and with 100 samples. And well, it seems that the results are pretty similar in both these cases. And therefore, it seems that you can actually start with pretty small sampling um like small number of samples just to identify where you know what's the roughly shape of the of the optimization space and then once you know you are around the local minimum you can increase the number of samples and just find the correct parameters okay so to wrap it up what i've accomplished so i implemented the core algorithm i'm improved on the pre-processing part i've implemented additional initialization strategy compared to the to the paper and i've learned a lot in the process well also i forgot to mention i actually uh well i have not exactly reproduced the results but i reproduced like some of the results and I've learned one thing, which is that actually just reproducing the results of the paper, just having the paper in front of you is like pretty hard because there's like a lot of things people kind of, even if paper is detailed, like people kind of leave out uh, because they think it's like obvious or they don't ex describe it, you know, carefully enough so that someone can get confused or you just might miss something from the paper or they're like implementation details that, that also matter. So some, before we get to the questions, some additional information. So the whole project took me about 80 hours to accomplish. Um, I was, I counted as like productive time. So like without any coffee breaks, like 80 hours of like pure work. Uh, out of this five, eight hours spent on creating this and practicing this presentation. Uh, the only like reference I used was the paper and like other papers that they mentioned. Uh, as I mentioned, I sent one email to Eric. So, like that's not entirely true. I sent one email to Eric, and he made like he answered my questions about like basically like two sentences in the paper. I wasn't able uh, to reproduce. Every, all the code, all the research reports. If you would like to. If something is interesting to you, you can read the detailed report on, on GitHub. And uh, well, I finally got the job. So well, that was that was a success. If this topic sounds interesting, um, here are a couple of papers that are touching on, on this topic of like optimization with QAOA, not not on factoring and VQF, but about basically the, the, the research I did around QAOA. Um, so I will, like, I hope this, this presentation will go, I will create a PDF and add this presentation to the, to the repository. That, that would be the easiest. Okay. So thank you very much. You can find me on my blog, uh, Musty Thoughts, and you can find me on Twitter at, at M Steckler. And now I will get back to the questions. So. I will answer the ones that are already there and answer any more if you if you have any. And I will actually turn off my screen sharing. Hover, click here to close, hover here to hide. Oh, here is close this. And I will show you my face. This is my face. Hello. Okay, so 
questions. So please ask questions if you if you have any, and I will be answering the ones that we have here. Cool. So you mentioned VQE was used for recruitment. Did you do this by request of Zapata when you joined them, or did you do it independently and submit it? So actually, the the story is that they told me. I was actually uh, unemployed at that time. I was looking for a job, and I was there was a, a lot a lot of thing, things happening. And after the first interview with Zapata, they told me, "Okay, so could you tell us a little bit about the project? Some some project you you made, like make a presentation of a project." And I, since I wanted this job pretty badly, I already started implementing the VQ, VQF like sometime before like two two weeks earlier and i thought okay so i have like two weeks left for the presentation i need to give them so i'll just like finish this project and present the results to them and you know see what what happens so yeah it was like zapata asked me to show some project i did i have i could have chosen like some other i i had but i i chosen to like implement this and you know, do this. So I hope this this answered the question. Okay, what if QA away gets close to the grant state, but actually, but doesn't actually reach it? Do you have an advantage in that case? Can you get P and Q? This is actually a very good question. So QA away is quantum approximate optimization algorithm, and we don't really care about getting the exact ground state. So if you have uh, S SU um i remember in one of the plots i was showing the squared overlap so basically it is like overlap with the ground state so the better the overlap and like the higher like yeah like the more overlap you have the closer you are to the ground state but at the same time if you have you know 10 percent overlap and you can like you are you have basically like 10 percent probability that you will get the correct result so if you take 1000 samples well one of the samples will be the correct one right so you actually care in case of qyoa you actually care about only getting the results not like the bit string not necessarily getting the exact ground state and therefore uh, you actually get advantage in that case, even though you you don't have P and Q, uh, like you don't have the the exact ground state. This is also uh, there is like the CVAR paper um, where they kind of exploit this this thing a little bit. How can this be applied in a real world environment? I'm looking at smart cities and the potential uh, for edge computing. Is there any case you believe this could be applied here? Uh, no. So <laughs> basically. Mm, the answer is that, well, this is still, you know, um, well, this is still still in in its infancy, and we don't have how to say that uh, we don't have any practical applications for QA away. So you you have seen that I I was using up to eight layers, and it wasn't enough to solve the problem in some cases, and these problems are like toy problems basically uh, in the recent google paper on the real hardware they were able to get up to three layers so this is where we are with qa away right now so it's not really applicable right now in you know in any any way we are working hard to, to make it but we are not there yet and the problem is that actually the first applications will be probably very specific and very like handcrafted for a given problem so it won't be that like someone for example uh you know data scientist in like some company will be able to take you know this qa away and apply it to like their problem in like health data or, or whatever else because in the beginning it will require a lot of like expertise on the quantum end uh, to actually make it work for example encoding the hamiltonian how to do it to minimize the number of qubits required and so on and so on and this will be pretty hard so well as 
the field progresses, it will get easier and easier. But I, I wouldn't expect um, and like out of the box solution for you know the, the next couple of years. Okay, so can you explain how did you arrive at the Ising Hamiltonian from the cost Hamiltonian? So I think I answered it, but if not, let me know in the chat. And also, if you have any other questions, please please ask them. Um, I would love to answer some more questions if you have. So, <laughs> okay, thanks for for confirmation. No questions. Oh, I'll ask one. <laughs> okay. Um, and a few weeks uh, before the lockdown, I was on this uh, dinner with some uh, um, bureaucrats from Brussels. You know, one of the topics they were talking is about uh, you know how to make Europe a center for quantum computing and so on. And one of the things that uh, came around is uh, this thing of uh, brain drain. You know, of uh, European talent to the other side of the Atlantic. So my question to you is, uh, why did you pick? Uh, um, um, uh, Canada, why not another European uh, capital? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I was doing when I was uh, I decided like roughly two two and a half years ago. I started to like look into some other career options than what I was doing at the time, and I, I decided to go into into quantum computing. And when I did my research. It turned out that at that point in time, there were basically three hubs of quantum computing companies. So one was Silicon Valley, one was Toronto, and the other one was London. And basically, at that point in time, um, Toronto was just like the, 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 the looked like the best option. So right now. I know there are like more companies in Europe, and it's like possible to you know find some places in Europe when when you can actually work for quantum computing companies. But back then, it wasn't really the case. I mean, they're like yeah, like London would be London also could be could be good idea, but there were like other reasons why like me and my wife who liked Canada over over UK. Which had like nothing to do with with you know like professional matters, so I mean in my case that was that was basically it. But I'm actually I'm I'm happy to see that there are more quantum companies in Europe and like this this job market is is actually growing in Europe. Um, still, I think it's, it's bigger on like the side of the Atlantic I'm right now on, but yeah, it's growing. I mean, yeah. I hope. You didn't mention Brexit, huh? <laughs> I have not mentioned Brexit. Yeah, so that was like one of the one of the things. That <laughs> okay. Were problematic. And uh, what would you advise to a young researcher um, coming up of the university? You know, some uh, to following your uh, your path from your own um, journey from being from um, academia to uh, industry. So, um, well, I actually. I would say like I, I said quite a lot about this topic uh, a on my blog and B on a like talk I gave two weeks ago. Um, you can find it probably on my Twitter or LinkedIn. But uh, in short, I would say just you know get your hands dirty and like don't be afraid of all those equations and like physics and hard things in um, you know things that like look scary, just like start doing a project and implement something like the, the, the stuff I did, right? Okay, VQF, it, I, I wouldn't, I mean, actually it might make a good project for, for like a beginner, just trying to take this paper, which is really clearly, clearly written. And then like reading up on, on QAOA and trying to implement all this stuff. Uh, well, it might be you know, the pre-processing part was, actually like pretty pretty hard so you would spend a lot of time on like classical end of the things but i think that that could be doable so the first project i did was trying to implement traveling salesman problem and well i 
even though I didn't have like, I had like very little background in quantum computing, like one university course. I, I, I was able to do this just by like, you know, reading paper, trying hard, writing it down in my notebook and, you know, trying to understand what's happening there. And I finally got there. So yeah, just, I, I would say just like, I, I'm the person that like likes learning by doing more than like just, just by reading. So that, that's something I can recommend. But as I, as I said, uh, yeah, there's like a lot of stuff on this on my um, on my blog. Yeah, uh, just look. Yeah, so yeah, that's. Uh, oh, ask a question. Sorry, question. Where do you see quantum computing being applied to smart city within the next twelve months? Well, in the next twelve months, I don't see quantum computing being applied to smart city. I might be wrong. Well, everything regarding this, you know, future of uh, quantum computing and applications of quantum computing is like speculation. And well, I that that's just like what it is. I mean, no, no one knows really. Um, but actually, I think the timeline usually people talk about is like three to five years, um, which is like a moving target. <laughs> So it was three to times years of like first commercial applications two years ago when I like got into this. Um, but still, I think we're we are definitely as like supremacy experiment shows, we were getting closer. But yeah, I think the f it's like really hard to say. I mean, it might turn out that like, you know, someone will figure out like a good algorithm like the next month and you know, it will, or like some hardware improvement that will actually change the game. But at the same time, I, I think that smart cities is not probably the first use case. More, probably more um, like chemistry simulations or perhaps quantum machine learning. There's a lot of research going on there. Mm, perhaps optimization, but like my personal bet would be on, on some like chemistry kind of related um, computations though it's just like as i said it's pure speculation like hard to stay really how hard is it for you to understand the book by nielsen and trunk now huh so nielsen and trunk for those of you who don't know um, it's like the classic textbook um in quantum computing i'm from time so i've actually never read nielsen and trunk like from end to end from start to end uh i just from time to time take this book, like read something. Uh, well, there are things that are obvious to me and there are things I struggle with. So for example, uh, recently, yeah, I was I was writing this blog post on QAOA. I was trying to understand some concepts. So I checked it in Nielsen and Trunk. I couldn't understand a thing. So I actually went to some other book, which was actually lecture notes by Scott Aronson. And he explained this same topic in a much more approachable way. So it ha it, it depends. How do you feel the current global pandemic will affect the quantum computing field? I don't know. I'm not an expert on, you know, macroeconomics and stuff like this. So probably will not answer, will not affect like software development and algorithm development that much. More like hardware because, you know, people need to get into the labs and just like they can do that remotely. But on the other hand, the economic fallout that will happen after that will affect everything. So it's really, I, I'm not the person qualified to, to answer this question. Thank you, um, Michael. Is there any other question uh, from the audience? Also, if you, would like to give me some feedback then uh yeah like you can send me an email afterwards or write me a message on like whatever platform you prefer um i would be uh, grateful for that okay no more so, questions no more questions so i hope you enjoyed the webinar i certainly enjoyed it thank you so much uh, michael for the presentation and uh, we look forward certainly of having you uh, do uh, more webinars with us. <laughs>
and uh, yeah. Um, to the rest of the audience, we will share um, uh, resources, any extra resources that uh, Michal, Michal um, shares with us. And uh, yeah, you will also get notified uh, anytime we have uh, uh, the next webinars um, scheduled. So thank you so much. Uh, stay safe and uh, I'll see you in the next uh, uh, webinar. Yeah, thank you very much. That was a pleasure. Bye. Have, have a good day. day.